So welcome to meeting number 52 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security. We will start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House Order of November 25th, 2021. Members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. Pursuant to the order of reference of Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, the committee resumes consideration of Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments firearms. The committee resumes clause by clause consideration and uh, we'll get to speaking list, which carries on from yesterday and shortly. But before we resume debate, I will now welcome the officials who are once again with us today. From the Department of Justice, we have Paula Clark, Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section. Phaedra Glushek, Counsel, Criminal Law Policy Section. From the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, we have Rachel Mainville Dale, Acting Director General, Firearms Policy. And from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Mr. Rob Daly, Director, Strategic Policy, Canadian Firearms Program. Murray Smith, Technical Specialist, Canadian Firearms um, Program. Okay, so so well, with that, I turn the floor to Madame uh, Michaud. La parole est à vous. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, colleagues. I'm happy to see you. Before starting, I'd like to take a moment to say that we are December this on December the sixth, 33 years ago today. There was a tragedy that uh, took place at the Ecole Polytechnique, so I'd like to offer my condolences and all of my sympathies to the nearest and dearest of the victims and the victims who were wounded that day as well. The weapon used that day was a Ruger Mini-14. It was a semi-automatic gun, and uh, my colleagues know that uh, the cartridge that he had, had was 30 rounds. It allowed him to kill 14 women and wound many others. And that weapon has been legal in Canada because it was categorized as a hunting weapon, uh, which is an absurdity along, according to a lot of researchers. So I'd like to invite my colleagues to be respectful in their comments today because today is a day of commemoration. People have been working for 33 years to uh, make the federal government do more in terms of assault wep rifles and weapons, and so they do away with them. And that is the uh, goal of G4. And I uh, might ask people to be respectful. And I would also ask people to n stop the intimidation of uh, the witnesses who are here to answer our questions. I understand that it's not easy for them any more than it is for us. We receive a lot of questions from our constituents, sometimes from angry people, because there's a great deal of misinformation that's circulating. And perhaps the government has not well explained the amendment that they tabled here. So I once again invite my colleagues to be respectful of the people who are here to help us today to answer our questions, and to the people who are listening to us who would be interested in uh, in saying something, I invite them to be careful in what they say. So before beginning, Mr. Chairman, I also want to take the time to speak out against the poly um, promotional code by the Canadian Coalition for Firearms to encourage people to buy their merchandise on their website. And I think doing marketing on the backs of victims is disgusting. And I invite colleagues also to speak out against that and to disassociate themselves from that company and that initiative. Now for G4, I think the government has a legitimate intention, but what's unfortunate is that they're doing everything backwards. They haven't explained their initiative, as I said. C21 dealt um, mainly was dealing with uh, handguns and red flags and so on, and they said at the outset that they would amend their own bill, so we can understand that they already judged the initial version to be imperfect. But we can, I can understand is for the support of some groups who support them, the government promised them to amend the bill with an amendment such as the one we've seen here today. 
to banish assault weapons that are military-style weapons. And uh, I don't know if it's really uh, should be acceptable because it goes beyond the scope of B Bill C-21, which dealt with handguns. Since May 2021, what I've understood is that the government has uh, secretly drafted this amendment without consulting groups concerned, because groups have said to us over the last few weeks that they were not consulted. And it's the same thing for the airsoft uh, guns. That industry doesn't seem to have been consulted by the government, unfortunately, either. So the government uh, let the bill follow its course. They allowed the debates to happen in the House on air soft guns, yellow flags, red flags. They allowed members of the committee to invite experts to hear their opinions on the impacts that the bill might have, particularly for handguns and airsoft-type guns, yeah, red and yellow flags again, etc. So you have to remember during the 2015 election, the Liberals committed to take a series of steps to get guns off the streets, and handguns and assault rifles, and that's what we can see in their former platform. The 1st of May 2020, they banned many that were um, banned immediately, and they wanted to uh, the M16s, the R15, the M4, and the Mini Ruger 14. So the ban also was targeting other weapons that had a that could launch a bullet with an energy of more than 10,000 joules. And these these are criteria that we find in the Amendment G4. But the weapons that are part of that criteria are already banned. And so they're already prohibited guns. So I would like the witnesses to uh, clarify that. That's in E and F of G4. Is that what we were to understand from that? Answer, yes. So you can see with that answer, that clarifies a number of things. We see people, we see parts of, of this amendment uh, has never really been presented probably. The government hasn't really clarified all of this for us. So I have to say that this is mainly what the Bloc Québécois is uh, reproaching the government for. They did it all backwards. They, it's really difficult to find your way through such a binder and explain to constituents what this is all about. So I'm happy that we have experts here today to answer our questions because the Liberal Party isn't able to explain its own um, f way of functioning. But I don't even, I barely know where to start. If we come back to Amendment C G4, what I understand is that it is carrying out campaign promises that they made. So I understand they want to ban assault rifles, and the Bloc Québécois agrees with this. And I even uh, said during the hearings we had on C21 is that if they hadn't done that, the Bloc Québécois would table an amendment to do that. And that's exactly what we did do with BQ1, which was defeated. All the parties here voted against it. We were proposing that uh, weapons definition be said that it should be uh, d defined, and it should be the experts that define what an assault weapon is. And we have to make a distinction between a uh, military-style assault weapon and a hunting rifle. We don't want to stop hunters from hunting. That was never our intention. And I want that to be very clear, Mr. Chairman. So the definition would have been much clearer for everyone if we had gone through a list. And that is what uh, I is. It's a firearm listed in the schedule to this part of my feu B. But this annex, the Liberals never took time to explain it. So it's difficult for us to deal with G4 without talking about that annex. So what I would like to know is on what criteria did they base themselves to create that annex? And when we ask questions about it, it becomes more and more clear. So I'll al allow myself to do so since we have the expert with us here today. I understand that the first part of the annex refers to models that are already prohibited. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I think it's paragraph one. There were, I think, 86 weapons that were banned in the 80s. 
Thank you. So this list includes weapons that were banished or prohibited for years. And this also comes under the 2020 ban. Yes, it's paragraphs 87 to 96, I believe. Thank you. And on top of that, there are weapons that were newly prohibited weapons, if this was passed. And through all of that, there are weapons that are exempted from that prohibition, if I understand correctly. Well, I think it's paragraph after 96 in Annex B are models that complete the prohibition list from May 2020. So using the same criteria, except when you get to the issue of, of the, the weapons designed before the Second World War and are present on the Canadian market. There's no list of exemptions but for that under 96. So there isn't necessarily a list of exemptions, but if we l f rely on what existed before certain models, we can say that this weapon, for example, would be prohibited with the exception of such and such models. Yes, now I understand your question better, thank you. When we look at the umbrella that exists over uh, paragraphs 95 or 96, that has to be read with the list. So Model X, of, 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 does it have the energy, well, it, it does it have a discharge of more than 10,000 joules? Those are there. So it's not necessarily every model of weapon X that would be prohibited. It's only those who come under that category. Thank you. So if we understand correctly, E, F, and G are the definition that is proposed by the government at, for prohibited firearms, and that would serve for the classification of future models that might be designed for later on. And the weapons that are listed in the annex don't necessarily have that definition. Do I understand that correctly? Well. I would say that there might be a kind of unification of that. When you talk about paragraphs E and F, that's the same thing as what we find in paragraphs 95 and 96. So there's some overlap. So that confirms that the list has some variance but the weapons that can discharge with the uh, energy of over 10,000 joules, that is prohibited. So if somebody has a carabine that is that strong, but it has a, a, an energy of only 4,000 joules, that's allowed. Okay. Now, if I may say that the fears of many hunters comes from all of this confusion, and it could have been avoided if this had been presented in the initial bill and had technical data on them and had been able to ask questions about it. And so it might be have a nice to have a legislative summary of this, and it might have helped us at the committee. So right now we don't have any kind of summary uh, for, under, for G4, so it really complicates things somewhat. And it complicates things to for us, for us to be able to clarify things for the greater public. I find it a bit unfortunate that the government is counting on us to deal with this impasse because that's where we find ourselves right now. It's an impasse on G4. And so long as the parliamentarians sitting at this table don't have the tools to be able to clearly explain this in 15 seconds or less what this amendment uh, is intended to do, I think we'll never find agreement. And to add to all of that, there's the Minister of Public Safety and even the Prime Minister who have uh, hinted that they're in, in the last couple of days that weapons or guns used just for hunting might in fact be found in this list. So uh, one or a thousand, I mean, how are we supposed to find that? How are we supposed to categorize these? We're not pre experts in the subject, even though we've learned more and more. 
how is the public supposed to be able to identify these guns? So what seemed to me to be a possible solution to all of this would be to have a clear definition of what an assault rifle is today that would become prohibited. So rather than proceeding with a list to say uh, if your weapon corresponds to this criteria, or these criteria, then we can create a list. And so I understand that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of models of these kind of weapons that are, exist today. So it's really difficult to see your way clear through this with this kind of a list. So we're understanding more and more why we dis they decided to try and proceed in this way, but in my opinion, it wasn't the best choice. One of the questions that I have if we pass G4 in its current form with I that refers to the schedule and there are manufacturers who find a way to, to get around that, are we going to have to re review this legislation every time there's a new weapon that comes out on the market? manufacturier, par exemple, euh, fait un nouveau modèle qu'il met en vente et là, comment ça fonctionne? Est-ce que c'est la GRC qui, 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 qui appelle le manufacturier pour dire, là, ça ne fonctionne pas, votre arme que vous venez de faire, elle est illégale? Ou comment est-ce que ça va fonctionner pour pas que, justement, ces nouveaux sure. modèles-là soient mis en vente? So, 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 uh, testing one, two, is, is it working now? Is testing one, two? Okay. Would you want me to repeat the question? Well, I understood, but I perhaps the others, uh, for the benefit of the committee, yes. My question was, if a manufacturer decides to design a new kind of weapon that would be intended to get around the regulations, but because in the bill, in the legislation it says because variants of this model, I'm sorry, it's difficult to explain as a question, it would be a variant. So it would be illegal. So how does that work? Is it the RCMP that is made aware of this? Uh, does Can the manufacturer just decide to get around the law and saying it's not a variant? How does it work? I will ask my colleagues from the RCMP to answer that question. The, the determination of the classification of a firearm can, in principle, be done by anybody. Uh, nobody owns that. Uh, any person can look up the criteria that, that are in the criminal code and compare the characteristics of the firearm uh, to those terms that are in the criminal code and arrive at a conclusion as to whether the firearm is non-restricted, restricted, or prohibited. However, for greater clarity uh, and and for uh, purposes of, of uniformity across the country, uh, the RCMP does keep a database, the firearms reference table, uh, which catalogs firearms and determines uh, their classification according to the matrix in the criminal code. And that's available to, to police, to officials, and to the general public for their reference. Uh, now, to answer the other part of your question, the, the actual assessment is made depending on exactly what the criteria are. So if, if you were looking at one of the paragraphs, uh, paragraph 1 to uh, 94, for example, or paragraphs uh, 97 and onwards, those are based on the principal model of the firearm being named, and then any variant or modified version of it is also included. So the, the exercise in classification there would be based on whether or not the firearm in question was uh, related to the original firearm in a way that would include it within the bounds of a variant or modified version. In the case of paragraphs 95 and 96, there are explicit physical criteria, and the, uh, the, the question would be to accurately determine the, the diameter of, 
of the bore or the energy of the projectile, as the case may be. And then the fire must classify depending on whether it's over the thresholds or not. Thank you. Did you have something else to add? Greater, greater clarity. Um, there is no variant in the Evergreen definition. So every new firearm entering the country would be matched against those criteria that are in the definition G. Mm -hmm. Where variant applies is as it relates to the schedules that you alluded to earlier. And so we would be looking at mm -hmm. both those. So if, if a firearm's coming in and it is uh, a variant of one of the listed firearms, then it would be put into the schedule accordingly. However, we would be going forward, most of it would be up against G and looking at each one of those criteria individually, so not as a variant. And I'd just like to add to my colleagues' comments that variant is a well-known term mm -hmm. that has been in the classification regulations since 1995, and it's been judicially considered and a very well-known term used by um, experts. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. That brings me to another question. And I don't know if I asked it last time, but in the French version of J, J we talk about hunting weapons, but in the English version, it, it doesn't say anything like hunting. And so I understand that it was drafted in English and, and in French, it's not a translation in French that might explain the thing, but it's the term that's commonly used in French to refer to that sort of, of, of weapon, but then it's difficult to explain to people that there are no hunting guns that are prohibited when it's written in black and white that we're talking about semi-automatic hunting weapons. And so how can we interpret that in French? Yes, it's a good a very good question. Um, the fusil de chasse is used in this uh, part of the bill. Um, it is a term that is used in other federal statutes and regulations, but also in the criminal code regulations that have been part of what well, the 1995 uh, regulations. So that's a term that is used um, in both federal regulations and acts, and including in the criminal code definition. So it's a term that's already been previously used and is well known, uh, which we've incorporated into the definition um, in, oh, sorry, not into the, def the mm -hmm. definition of uh, or the G4 motion, I should say. Thanks. So we can understand that that doesn't necessarily include guns that are usually used for hunting. Yes, it's really just the translation that was chosen by the drafters. These people are highly specialized in the legislative framework and once again, uh, I'm not a drafter, but we look at that, and if we change it in the bill, what are the consequences for all the, the regulations that are connected to this instrument? Okay. They also use not just the other federal acts, but when the drafters look at terms, both in English and, and French, it, it should be the equivalent. Uh, they look at Termium, which is a it's a database of terms in English and French. They look at the French, um, La Rosse, uh, the different dictionaries in French as well, and then they look at also the other acts and regulations. So that's how they came up with the term um, in in this uh, legislation. Motion. I understand that changing G or trying to sub make a sub amendment to that could change the spirit of the definition that they were wanting to put in place. But to your knowledge, if we added to, uh, with the exception of uh, guns reasonably used for hunting, would that change the spirit of the definition at, um, in G as it's, late, as it's written now? Whether or not we could capture that it's, it is or is not a hunting rifle or a shotgun, sorry? That it's not. So, um, I mean, that is an exercise that we could could look at. But for example, um, in the French, canon long avec une avec une a firearm, and that could encompass some rifles as well. So, um, it it just depends on what the term is and how we could define it. I could turn to my colleagues in public safety to see if there's any um, any other considerations they'd like to add. I think that there are always 
impact. This is a, a drafting exercise. And I think it's difficult to look at it and say, is it possible to make changes to that? And this is your debate indeed here. We're here to assist you. It's, is it possible? Maybe. But I have trouble uh, seeing if we could, I have trouble giving you a really definitive answer. Thank you very much. I'm wondering how to proceed with this famous list. It would not have been easier for everyone to proceed otherwise. And I wonder if it was in, within the options that the government had. I don't know uh, maybe the mover of the amendment might answer this, or if you can. But I know that in 1994, the Americans made a very clear list of prohibitive weapons. So it's a good and a bad list, because there was a significant list of exclusions, which diluted the definition quite a bit. But is that an option that was considered here? Let's, let's list the models in, in a separate schedule and let's broaden the Firearms Act by however many pages. Is that something that could have been done or that was considered? Thank you for the question. I have limits to what I can discuss here, and I can't really discuss what the options that the government um, took into consideration when they um, developed this amendment. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I can ask the proposer of the amendment, why he decided to proceed in that way. Is that possible? It's free to step up in any, in any of the debate if he wishes, um, but uh, it's really not, um, it's, it's really kind of odd to be questioning the other. Uh, well, if I may, if I was moving an amendment, my colleagues would certainly ask me where that came from and why I was moving it in that way. So I think it's legitimate to ask the mover of the amendment. If Mr. Chang wants to respond, please, please do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The amendment was moved on the advice of the official. If you have questions, you can please direct them to the official that are here present. Tonight, today to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Um, carry on. That's, I, I, that's what I'm trying to do, but I understand there are limits to what they can say. And I think that's the whole problem of getting politics involved in this. <laughs> if we could keep uh, politics out of it, it would be much easier for everyone. So I'll carry on with my questions. What I understand from the structure of the schedule, we've, and I know that some models are already prohibited, some will be later on, and I think the timing also of when, when that will happen is a legitimate question as well. I understand that it might necess not necessarily be um, by decree, it could, in the bill or it could be by decree later on. Schedule 2, the list, would come into force by order in council. Okay. So it would be a decision to be taken. There's flexibility for the government to take in terms of when uh, it would want to bring into force the schedules, uh, as well as the most of the definition. There is one part that would come in 30 days after Royal Assent, um, just with respect to the firearm part. Okay. Donc on peut so we might, in fact, understand or speculate that that moment in time before it comes into effect is to allow the gun owners who own these weapons to get rid of them. That's my understanding. Perhaps you can answer that. Yes, as with the May 1st, 2020 uh, amendment, uh, there was an amnesty at that time. The government decided to um, have a, a, an amendment, or sorry, an amnesty that coincided and to give owners time to comply with the law. In this case, the motions have been put forward. No amnesty or decision has been made in terms of an amnesty at this time or not uh, no decision there is no amnesty at this time being put forward or compensation so by the time this comes into force by OIC um, owners would have to become compliant with the law okay by amnesty do you mean a grandfather clause so they could continue to own those weapons for some time 
the um, the schedule or the defin the definition in E G um, comes into force by order in council. At that point, um, when the May first OIC came in to effect, there was an amnesty order. Mm -hmm. The delayed coming into force of of um, G and the schedule in I would give the government an opportunity to decide how to proceed mm -hmm. with these firearms. Okay. Thank you. So that would allow the government some time to propose a buyback program or something like that, I imagine. I know we're still waiting for the buyback program for the weapons that were prohibited in 2020, but uh, so I don't know where that will happen or where that will take us. But I think that would reassure the people who are perhaps um, owners of guns that are in that schedule to know what they're supposed to do at that point in time. We hadn't really had an answer to that. And I understand you can't really give us one today. In the future. Uh, and again, I forgot to mention that um, the list in Schedule 1 would are already prohibited, so um, that there would be no change in the classification of those firearms between paragraph 1 and 96. But that is a decision to be made in the future, and we can't speak to that. Okay. Merci. Thank you. We're trying to understand the process through the list. I perhaps have a question for the gentleman here. If you could explain to us in general how the process unfolds for classification at the RCMP. How does that currently work? The, uh, the classification of the, of the firearm itself, uh, as I indicated earlier, is based on an assessment of the characteristics of the firearm and how they compare with the parameters that are in Part Three of the Criminal Code, uh, which affect classification. So, so all, uh, everything that's pertinent about the firearm is determined and evaluated against <coughs> those criteria, and then a decision is made as to what classification it falls into. In, in, in terms of the administrative procedure, uh, the the goal of the organization that produces the firearms reference table is to. Um, determine classifications of firearms as early as possible in order to populate the FRT with the description of the firearm and its classification long before any arrive in Canada so that when the firearm does arrive, it is dealt with by customs and other authorities in the appropriate manner. You're talking about the criteria, indeed. Is that something that's public, the criteria? on which you base your decisions to categorize weapons? Yes, the, the criteria are in Section 84 of the Criminal Code. And uh, there are a variety of criteria that affect the classification of firearms in, in, in several different ways. Each, each portion of Section 84 deals with firearms for a certain purpose in its own way, so there's no there's no standard way of dealing with it. So in, in some cases, a firearm could be prohibited because the barrel, for example, is cut down. In other cases, the firearm could be prohibited because it fires in a fully automatic manner. Uh, in the case of the schedule that we're speaking about today, a firearm could become prohibited because it is a variant or a modified version of a firearm that's named uh, in the regulations. Uh, a firearm could also become prohibited if it's chambered for a caliber that produces an energy over 10,000 joules of muzzle energy. Uh, a firearm could become prohibited if it has a, um, a bore diameter over 20 millimeters, and so on. There are, there are many different criteria that apply in different ways. So the process would be to look at the characteristics of the firearm and determine whether or not they interact with any of these criteria that are that are sprinkled through the, the criminal code and the associated regulations. Yes, and is reasonable use of the weapon for hunting, is that part of the considerations of what you're talking about? For the purposes of producing the firearms reference table, no. The classification is based entirely on the criteria that are published in the criminal code and the regulations. Okay, merci. Okay, thank you. 
more clarification. Um, <coughs> as Mr. Smith has indicated, the firearms reference table is a law enforcement tool and the classification determinations made by the Canadian Firearms Program are not legal determinations. They are simply tools that are available to law enforcement to help law enforcement uh, determine whether or not a specific firearm is restricted, non-restricted or prohibited. The final determination of the classification of a firearm is made by the courts. So all of, so at any point, um, the, the classification determination made by the CFP can be, um, can be challenged, uh, challenged in court or by the um, uh, CITT, the Canadian International Trade Tribunal. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It's been brought to our attention that certain weapons that were added to the schedule are guns that are reasonably used for hunting, even if those models did formerly or at some time have a military use. So I'm not going to start naming uh, the B M semi-automatic 86 as um, a handle like a handgun would be now illegal and other models that have a more classic shape would be completely legal. So is that what we are to understand? I'm not completely sure which firearm you're referring to, so... Le Benelli. The Benelli MR Super 90... 86. The effect of the schedule, uh, likewise in the regulations which are currently in force, and so those models would remain either non-restricted or restricted depending upon their characteristics. Donc, est-ce qu'on doit comprendre que ces caractéristiques? Are we to understand from these characteristics that there's one will be prohibited model model and one won't, according to the shape of the the handle? So we're basing ourselves on visual characteristics or other. I don't have the right word, but the, the two weapons might have exactly the same power, but because of the look, one would be prohibited and the other not. So is that, is that right? I can't speak directly to what, the, what was in the mind of the, uh, of, of the policymaker who made the decision to create this list as it was. However, by analyzing paragraph seven, it's, it's, it's plain to see that those models of the Benelli M1 and M3 shotguns, which are in a hunting configuration, are exempted as non-restricted firearms, and those which are in a tactical configuration are prohibited. So it's somewhat the look that, that, that draws the line. If the fact that one more a more military look versus a hunting civilian gun is is what might make the distinction between one prohibited weapon and another. It's the totality of the characteristics. So the the M1 and M3 shotguns started out as military shotguns, which were later modified to make them uh, acceptable for for hunting purposes. So there there would be a, a combination of 
of accessories, uh, which you could you could describe as appearance, but it has more to do with ergonomics for the shotgun. Uh, so a combination of physical characteristics, like the configuration of the stock, uh, the configuration for the sights, uh, plus the tactical versions generally have a shorter barrel uh, than the hunting shotguns, and uh, they may have a larger magazine as well. So there are some mechanical differences between them. So it's not just the configuration, the fact that it might have a shotgun handle might make it uh, make it more like a military weapon rather than a hunting weapon, and is also its capacity. Well, whatever you said there. I would agree with that, but I would I would emphasize that it's based on the 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 functional characteristics of the firearm. It's not, not just a question of appearance. It's the, the fact that certain things like um, shorter barrels have more utility in a tactical application as opposed to a longer barrel, which would be, would be used for hunting, for instance. And to your knowledge? So the sound in the room is as high as it can go without causing feedback. So for members who can't hear, I would recommend you use your earpiece. Not helping a lot? Okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, easy, sir. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those weapons that have a more tactical configuration, if I can put it that way, in your experience, are they commonly used for hunting or not really? The... The... the the versions of the M1 and M3 shotguns that are uh, made with conventional sporting accessories are the ones which are commonly used for hunting. Uh, there's nothing that physically prevents any version of an M3 or M1 shotgun from being used for hunting. But if you, if you were to look at, say, the marketing material for these firearms as they're sold in Canada, it is the sporting configuration of the shotgun that is generally advertised for use for hunting. If we look at um, the barrel, and some have 14 inches, some are 19 inches, does that mean that they would be considered as prohibited weapons, prohibited, prohibited firearms? Barrel length is a factor that is considered for whether a firearm is prohibited or not in conjunction with other characteristics. So in, in the case of a, of a shotgun like a Benelli M1 or an M3, uh, the, the, if the barrel gets too short, the firearm could wind up being restricted, and if it gets shorter yet, it could become prohibited. It depends on exactly how the barrel becomes shorter and exactly what the length is. So it, it, it varies depending upon the exact circumstances. But, but essentially, uh, the, the, the shotgun barrel length is considered in conjunction with other factors to arrive at a determination of classification. And to your knowledge, what would be the length of a barrel that would be normal for a hunting rifle in, at this point in time? Oh, that varies according to the type of hunting, so it's there's no single answer for that. Do you think that there are many hunting rifles that would be found on, under I in the schedule? Under I. Your mic. Yeah, generally speaking, the, the schedule is made up of, of military and paramilitary style firearms. So there are relatively few hunting firearms in those schedules that were explicitly divined, designed for the purposes of hunting. There, there are bound to be some exceptions, though, and, and, and those are found in, in paragraph 7, which we've just been discussing, and uh, elsewhere, like paragraph 64, for example. So, so there are some firearms which are which are named in the schedule, 
uh, as exemptions and are used for hunting. But the, the majority of the firearms that are in the schedule are firearms which are either military originally or tactical in nature. Merci. Thank you. I uh, would like to repeat of what you said more or less in French. The majority of firearms that are found in the schedule are not guns that are reasonably used for hunting, but there might be a few. And some would be used for hunting. Any firearms that are designed for hunting that appear in the schedule. That said, there are firearms which can be or have been used for hunting. So it depends on on how you define reasonable, and that's going to depend on on who you ask. I mean, reasonable is a is a subjective uh, characteristic. Uh, what I can say is the majority of these firearms, if not all of them, are there uh, because they are either military firearms or tactical firearms or derivatives of those firearms. I come back to a question that I broached earlier somewhat. To your knowledge, is there a way of withdrawing control of this list from in the hands of politicians? What I'm trying to understand is, is that in enumerating the criteria that um, are listed in G4, would that be enough for you as a tool to classify I'm, I'm talking about you as the RCMP because you're the ones who do this. Would a definition be sufficient? Or does having a list really complete your work or allow you to better complete your work? Is a definition without a list useful to you? That's, that's really not our choice. Uh, the, the choice as to how firearms would be regulated lies with the government. And... and uh, with the Governor Council and with Parliament, and the RCMP applies the laws that they create. So using, using a schedule or using the regulations is one way of identifying firearms uh, that should not be in circulation. And th that system has the advantage of being able to name specific makes and models and limiting the effect of the change in law to only those kinds of firearms. As an alternative, a more general approach can be taken, uh, at, like in G4, with a, with a definition which is a, a, applies automatically to to all firearms which fit the criteria, and uh, the the kinds of firearms and the numbers of firearms that will be captured by the, the definition are are going to depend on the the exact wording of those provisions, and that is within the control of the Governor and Council and Parliament. Okay, merci. All right, thank you. There's, there's a term about having more than five um, cartridges. That concerns a lot of hunters because some think it's too vague. So can you confirm that the con definition of semi-automatic firearms Will not will affect future weapons as well. A particular definition, I believe, is designed to affect firearms in future. It's it's a forward-looking element uh, in the in the proposed amendments. The criteria in that definition are all concrete criteria, so it can be very readily determined whether a firearm is a rifle or a shotgun. It can be easily determined whether it has a semi-automatic semi action or not. Uh, it can be easily determined whether it has a detachable magazine or not, and it can be easily determined what the capacity of that magazine is, whether it's five cartridges, four, three, two, or whatever. So all, all of the criteria in that uh, particular provision are relatively easy to establish. Now, whether it prohibits the 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 correct firearms, if I may, is dependent on the goal of either Parliament or the Governor and Council, as the case may be. So they're the ones who decide what should be prohibited or what should not be prohibited, and the, and the terms of the definitions are determined accordingly. 
uh, officials can provide advice, but ultimately it's the government's decision as to what will be prohibited. I believe I'm understanding more and more the choice of proceeding in this way and to assure that the, the more, most models possible will be included in the bill. Now, I have a hypothetical question. Would it be possible for a future government to add, for example, a variant of the R-15 in the exceptions that, exemptions that we have in the schedule? And so my question is, what is what takes precedence, the prohibited weapons or the list of exceptions? Would anything prevent a future government from adding a variant to the exemptions or not? Well, as it stands, the exemptions really are for weapons that have been uh, prohibited in the 90s. So those that were made prohibited weapons in 2020, there are no exemptions. And so is it possible for a future government to add exemptions to the law? That is always a possibility. A, a, a future government could do that. Thank you. Another question that's rather hypothetical. If the amendment it passes, would that allow a sports shooter, for example, to rent a prohibited uh, weapon, uh, a semi-automatic or a gun that would be used exclusively at a shooting range without that person being the owner and without uh, that person having the option of bringing that weapon home. In the way in which this uh, amendment is drafted, does that leave no opportunity for such a person to own such a gun? Well, the question is, if a weapon is prohibited, can someone borrow one or, or rent one? Yes. Is it possible uh, that uh, we're not allowed to own such a thing or keep it at home, but if you bring it to a, a shooting range or, or a club, the way, in G4, the way in which G4 is drafted, would that allow for that? Well, if I understand correctly, I don't think it's possible to rent prohibited weapons. But I'll ask my colleague. The definition applies to rifles or shotguns. It doesn't apply to the handguns. Mm -hmm. So it's only dealing with rifles or shotguns. So just to make that clear, mm -hmm. so the handgun would be separate, and that would be something that under existing uh, provisions in the Firearms Act that would be um, regulated. Yes, but uh, so sh shotguns for uh, f aren't going to be in the same list as the re restricted weapons, whereas prohibited weapons, I, I can't rent that. Uh, I think if you look at an example, an automatic weapon, that cannot be rented and brought home. No. There are certain firearms in the schedule that would be collectible guns that are worth a great deal of money and that are generally just on display on a shelf because people collect guns. But if we understand that there might be some opening for a buyback program for those kinds of guns, or firearms, there are, there are some that are worth a fortune. So would G4 uh, imply significant challenges? Is that something we're looking at? Or has G4 just been drafted uh, just in the way it has? Maybe my colleague can jump in, is forward-looking. So it's meant to mm -hmm. look forward. Um, however, there are mechanisms to be able to come into compliance with the law right now if, they're, if a firearm is not included in the buyback program, which those firearms are in the schedule, the May 1st, the paragraph 87 to 96, I believe, are the ones that are included in the buyback. There is deactivation as well that's available to individuals to mm -hmm. come into compliance with the law. Again, we can't um, speculate as to any kind of buyback or or amnesty, uh, mm -hmm. but one way to come into compliance would be able to have a firearm deactivated um, to be able to keep that piece of um, that item in your house. Okay. Uh, Paula, did you want to add anything to that? No. That's okay. Okay. So the owner couldn't send, could sell rather that, that 
firearm uh, abroad. That would be impossible. Firearms prohibited. You cannot sell, transfer, import, export. So you would have to come into compliance by either um, surrendering it or de or deactivating it, or if there was an amnesty that allowed for other means of disposal or a government program buyback, uh, that would be the options open for the owner. Okay, merci. Okay, right. Thank you. I come back to the hunters' associations who got in touch with us and confirmed that uh, they were not consulted by the government for this particular amendment, for the drafting of it. They raised concerns that might be judged to be legitimate. For example, would a Weatherby Mark V that typically uh, with a hunting cartridge would be allowed and would not be prohibited by I, which refers to the schedule, whereas the variant that is designed for hunting elephants, or, uh, would the, the 480 would be prohibited. Is that what we're to understand? The, the Weathery Mark V rifle appears in, in paragraph uh, 96, I believe, which deals with high energy firearms. And it's only those Weatherby Mark V rifles which are actually chambered for a caliber that produces energies in excess of 10,000 joules, which would be prohibited. Uh, if the rifle was chambered in a, a, a different caliber that did not exceed 10,000 joules, then it would retain its existing classification, which is, for the most part, non-restricted. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you very much for your patience. I think that uh, answers uh, some of the questions I, that I had so far, but the more we move forward, it seems the more questions arise. So it's very difficult to actually understand everything. And I'm sure that colleague, my colleagues will also have some questions. So I would have a proposal to submit to my colleagues, Mr. Chair, that uh, could be maybe satisfactory to all. I would like us to invite Ex independent experts, independent from the government, so that they can explain the impact of this amendment on their industry or whatever. Um, so a bit like what we did, you know, the parliamentary, regular parliamentary process when we invite witnesses to testify at the beginning of e, of a study of a bill. I think that this, with this massive amendment, there are some witnesses that did not have the opportunity to speak to that amendment. So I would say that it would be legitimate to allow them to do so in the committee. So what I would like to ask is the following, that we may have two additional meetings to hear witnesses that might not have been heard by the committee. I think that this is a request that requires the, the unanimous consent of colleagues. So I'd like to ask if you know the subcommittee of the committee could meet to discuss the number of meetings that we could have with experts that we would like to hear at the committee. I think that it would be helpful to move the process forward if we had answers to our question and if the witnesses we might hear could be heard by the committee on specifically G4, which is an amendment which is quite a substantial amendment, you will agree. So I would like to invite them to be in favor of my proposal. I understand that it requires unanimous consent. So this is my proposal today so that we may move forward with G4. Uh, thank you. Um, that presents somewhat of a dilemma to me. We are in the throes of, um, there is a, an amendment on the floor that we're now debating. We can't bring forward another, another amendment. Um, to interrupt this process to go to more meetings um, is kind of problematic. I'm going to, if it's okay, I'll uh, suspend for a few minutes and have a have a chat with uh, with uh, the clerks. Thank you. Suspended. The meeting is resumed. So thank you all. We've had a number of discussions, um, and um, I'm not sure we have any kind of resolution. But I will uh, I will ask Madame Michaud to put forth her uh, unanimous consent motion. It's the only kind of motion we can deal with at this time. My understanding is the motion is. The unanimous consent motion is to seek unanimous consent 
that we convene a subcommittee meeting to discuss having additional witnesses, additional witness meetings on C21. Is that correct? That's exactly it, Mr. Chair. And I'm seeking unanimous consent for this. The subcommittee would meet in order to determine how many meetings would be necessary and how many witnesses we could hear in order to enable people who were not able to ask questions about the amendment to ask their questions. I think it's quite clear in the room we can see that several people are feeling frustrated. Not everyone was able to ask questions, and I think we would be able to move on with G4 after having listened to more witnesses. I understand that I cannot suggest a number of meetings because if I suggest it, I won't get unanimous consent. This is why I would like to ask the subcommittee to study this and to make a decision. So I'm asking and seeking unanimous consent. Hopefully we will be able to resolve this issue and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Michaud. Unanimous consent motion, I don't believe it's debatable. So I'm going to ask the uh, members if, if, if there is unanimous consent. Um, um, there is not unanimous consent. Um, but I certainly encourage the, all, all the members, all the parties at the table here to, to uh, continue to talk amongst yourselves to find a way forward on this. Um, that being the case, uh, Madame Michaud, were you finished? I would just add that I find that this is very disappointing. I think it would have enabled us to go forward. But that is all I have for questions today. I might ask questions later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, as we continue clause by clause consideration of, BC, of C21, I just want to take a moment and pause. I mean, we've had some good, healthy debates today, but I just want to pause and bring us back to the why of what we are doing here. As Madame Michaud noted, today is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. It commemorates the senseless murder of 14 women at École Polytechnique 33 years ago. And I think it's very important to never forget their names. And we must ensure that their death was not in vain. Geneviève Bergeron, Marise Lagagné, Marise Leclerc, Nathalie Croteau, Barbara Daigneau, Sonia Pelletier, Anne-Marie Edouard, Michel Richard, Annie Saint-Arnaud, Barbara Klusnik, Annie Turcotte. Fourteen women who were killed because they were women. Because I think it's important that we pledge and recommit our pledge to keep working to end gender-based violence, which is, as we all know, a lived reality for far too many women across Canada. I think we have a shared responsibility at this table, as we have healthy debates and discussions, to make sure we commit to ending gender-based violence once and for all together. You know, we're all here because we want to keep our community safe, to protect our neighbors and friends, to keep guns off our streets. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge the exceptional work of Police Souvian and the other advocates who have been working hard uh, to ensure that we have stricter gun control. This is not a partisan statement. It's one that recognizes the efforts of those who seek to keep our, keep our streets safer without taking away the rights and privileges of Canadians who hunt, who farm, and Indigenous communities. You know, we all have to accept that access to guns is a primary risk factor for armed violent behavior, and the simple fact that, an, that a firearm is present in a home increases the risks of violence and intimidation for the women, for women and children who live in those homes. We know that intimate partner violence, which is a subset of domestic violence, that involves a firearm is 12 times more likely to result in death than similar incidences that don't involve a firearm. We know that access to guns in the home triples the likelihood of homicides and multiplies the risk of suicide by five. And we've seen data in Canada that public re police re public reports show that between 37 and 42 percent of women and girls were killed with a firearm in 2019 and 2020. Data on murders committed by licensed firearm owners using a registered firearm or with firearms that were previously seized 
are not collected or available. As a result, it is not possible to estimate the effect of gun registration policy on the femicide. The presence of a firearm in a home increases the lethality of IEPV fivefold. Asking about the presence of firearms at home can help physicians in Canada develop a safety plan for those in at-risk situations, and Bill C-21 is going to go a long way in addressing gender-based violence in every community across Canada. And I know that every one of us at this table from all sides is committed to this. But I do believe that we have an obligation and an opportunity here to be smart about how we write good legislation in respect of firearms. You know, I've asked my conservative colleagues and others to tell us how to improve this bill, how to look at this list and to provide feedback. I have, must admit, other, I don't know if others have, but I have not received that feedback from my colleagues other than it's all bad. And it's all bad is not a good enough answer for victims' families. It's also not good enough for the farmers and hunters and indigenous communities who believe that we need stricter gun control. It may be good enough for the CCFR, but that's not who we are here to serve. But I do believe that every single law that we write can be made better. And we've done that at this committee, and we do that in other committees. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And I want to say personally, as I have said to my colleagues, I am committed to doing whatever I can, I know my colleagues are, to improve this legislation. That doesn't mean erase it from the books. It does mean improve it and work together to do that. And I think we have an ob we owe it not, we owe ourselves and this country an obligation to do that work. But I will say this before I get to some questions for officials. I find it incredibly problematic that there are organizations that are fundraising off tragedy. I found it appalling, and I would like my conservative friends to condemn what the CCFR did in seeking to provide a discount code on products for sale on their website with the discount code POLY. It is unacceptable. It is disgusting. And we all, every single one of us, need to speak out against this type of absolutely reprehensible behavior because whether you're a conservative or a liberal or a new democrat or a member of the bloc or a green, we should not be acting in that way. Canadians deserve better. All of our constituents deserve better. And I know that there are firearms owners who are absolutely appalled by that type of disgusting behavior. So I want to make sure that when we leave this room, there is not a single person out there that feels that anyone in this room is acting in a manner that enhances, that promotes, or that amplifies these types of aberrant views. And I hope that my colleagues will join me in that. So let's now get to the crux of some of the things that I know we want to discuss. So if I could uh, turn to our guests, and perhaps Ms. Clark, you could explain to us in layman's terms, what is the what does the definition intend to do so that people out there who are watching this and, you know, recognizing that everything gets clipped, tell us in layman's terms, please, what does the definition intend to do? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. I think um, perhaps the best way to go about explaining G4 is just to step back a little bit and um, discuss perhaps how firearms are prohibited through the criminal code. Section 84 of the Criminal Code sets out a definition of prohibitive firearms, and it lists some physical characteristics, plus it has uh, an ability to prescribe firearms as prohibited. So some of the physical characteristics are short-barreled um, short handguns, uh, fully automatic firearms, and sawed-off shotguns. The regulations have been in existence since the early 1990s. Um, prior, prior to, so from 1990, to 2000, there were approximately how many? 13, 13, 13 uh, families of firearms that were prohibited in the regulations. And then on May 1st, 2020, there was an OIC brought in that prohibited an extra, uh, an additional 15,000, uh, 1,500 <laughs> um, makes and models of firearms. There's 109 families. And it also prohibited. Um, two categories of firearms based on physical characteristics. So those are the firearms that are 10,000 joules um, and over, and then firearms with bore, bore diameters of 20 millimeters or greater. Um, 
when Bill C-21 was introduced, the government also undertook that they were going to fully ban assault-style firearms. So the, the policy direction taken by the government was to was two things. One was to amend um, the definition of prohibited firearms to codify the firearms that are currently prohibited in the regulations. And then the next step was to add additional assault style firearms that were not included on the May in the May 1st OIC. And then the third step was to add the evergreen definition. So if you walk through um, Bill G4, uh, motion G4, and if you start with E, you'll see that um, it includes language that it's a firearm that is capable of discharging a projectile with a muzzle energy exceeding 10,000 joules, other than a firearm designed exclusively for neutralizing explosive devices. So those are bomb diffusers. E is our firearms that are already prohibited in the regulations. So they're being ported, imported from the regulations to the definition of prohibited firearm. F was also already included in the regulations. These are firearms that are currently prohibited. And what F is proposing to do is to take them from the regulations and put them into the definition of prohibited firearm, thus codifying um, the ban on those firearms. G would be the, I'm going, I, actually I'm gonna, G is the evergreen definition. H is, comes late, is, is for motion that hasn't been moved yet. And, and I is the schedule, okay? So the schedule has three buckets. The first bucket are those firearms that were prohibited initially in the 90s, okay? Plus the firearms included in the May 1st OIC, the May 1st 2020 OIC. And it also adds additional variants that have come to the attention of the CFP since, um, since the regulations were made in May 1st, 2020. So that's why it looks like additional firearms are added, but those firearms were already prohibited. So that's what's in Schedule 1. All of the firearms in Schedule 1 are already prohibited. It's simply uh, moving them from the regulations to a schedule in the criminal code and codifying them. So the second part is everything following paragraph 97. Those firearms are not currently prohibited, but they are included in the schedule because they have the same capabilities as the firearms that were initially included in the May 1st OIC, that me meaning that they are capable of sustained rapid fire, meaning that they are of military tactical design and capable of receiving a large, uh, large uh, cartridge magazine. So, so that's what the schedule would, would do. Everything is listed by make and model. Okay, um, it adds new variants, and, it, and it, it proposes to codify the schedule. So everything would be listed by make and model. Easy, to, um, and the reason for that is for transparency and clarity, and so that the Canadian public can uh, search the schedule to see if the firearm is listed. For, um, paragraph G is forward-looking, so it proposes to amend the definition of prohibited firearm to add characteristics that would that would capture other firearms that would fall within the parameters of what is considered to be an assault style firearm. However, it's more restrictive than the characteristics that were used for the May 1st OIC in that it is um, limited to center fire ammunition and um, uh, limited as well also to shotguns and uh, rifles. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions. I, I, I do have a few, actually. I just sure. wanted to see if you could just, you know, if you can clarify, why do we reference both shotguns and rifles? Do you want to jump in? Well, I mean, so shotguns and rifles, the, the, otherwise, if, if, you didn't, if you didn't list it as a shotgun and rifle, it's going to apply to all firearms which would include um, handguns, but I'm going to, I believe Mr. Smith would probably have any, something else to add. That's essentially uh, the, the reason. It, the, the effect of the evergreening definition is limited to rifles and shotguns. And it's also listed in the criminal code, if I'm not correct, in those terms, correct? Or the firearms act, rather. 
Is it also not listed in? The, is that also not? Is that also not the language that's used in the criminal code? It's used in some places in the criminal code, but not universally. And okay. Some provisions apply to all firearms, right. whereas other provisions apply to just handguns, and, and yet more provisions apply to just rifles and shotguns. So it, right. it depends on what part of the classification matrix you are looking at. Okay. Thank you. You know, the list in G46 has been the source of tremendous consternation, as you have come to see. Um, could you provide a simplified list of G46 broken down by when these things were banned so that people could actually look at this and understand whether this is something that's been there on the ban list since the 90s or 2000 or 2010 or, or whatever? Because the last thing that we want, I think, is, and we are all, I think we are all in this maelstrom with our constituents of everyone assuming that everything on this list is net new, which you have clearly said it's not. But if we had that, I think it would be able to focus our conversations in a much more meaningful way. Is that something that you can provide for us? Yes, that's something we could provide the committee. Would you like it orally now, or would you like I, it? I, no, I don't think orally now. I don't think we want to sit through those 400 pages, and we I don't want to provide, do that to you. Uh, yes. But just out of, as a, of a guide, 1 through 86 in that list are firearms that were prohibited in the 1990s. Paragraphs 87 through to 96 were those that were from the May 2020 OIC. And after that are those that are proposed ad additions to complete the May 2020 OIC. Those are not currently prohibited. And, and just to make sure, 96 through, just do I want? Uh, sorry, it's 97. 232. 232. Right, okay. 97 to 232. So that's what we, and, and, and in that list, and, and in that list, I think there's a lot, uh, that's certainly where a lot of the conversation has been. So if I could then, Mr. Smith, turn to you, because I do want us to take the time to check the record on things. You know, the schedule that we have before, these include all of the firearms that are prohibited now in Canada, correct? Uh, short answer is no. The, there's a variety okay. of places within Section 81 of the Criminal Code where firearms can be defined to be prohibited. Okay. So the so the Schedule 1, which consists of a, essentially repeating from the regulations the firearms which were prohibited in the 1990s and right. in the 2020, okay. are prohibited right now because of the regulations and in future if this passes by the schedule. But there are other means by which firearms become prohibited, such as being fully automatic or such as having a sawed-off barrel and so on. Yeah. Th th those, those criteria are found elsewhere in the criminal code <coughs> classification matrix. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about some specifics because like many, like many, I think all of us, we've received correspondence from constituents and from others from across the country who are concerned. And so I just want to make sure we do all of what we can to clarify what needs to be clarified. So I'd like to ask you about a series of, of weapons that were, um, uh, that I have received correspondence, and others have received correspondence about. And the first is the Ruger number one. It's a single shot hunting rifle, rifle, and it's found in the list. Does this mean, from your perspective, that the government is proposing to ban all Ruger number ones, or is this list only targeting the Ruger number ones capable of firing certain calibers? It's the latter that's correct. The the Ruger number one rifles, which are prohibited, or yeah, which are prohibited now because they fall within paragraph 95 of the existing regulations, are prohibited if and only if they are chambered for a caliber which produces muzzle energies in excess of 10,000 joules. Uh, other Ruger number one rifles, which are chambered for different calibers that do not produce that level of energy will remain in the existing category, which, broadly speaking, is non-restricted. And, and just for clarity, this is in paragraph 95, so this predates... Yes, par paragraph 95 is part of the, uh, the regulations which came into effect in May of 2020 and which are repeated with exactly the same paragraph number in the proposed schedule. So this is not something new? The, the, the effect of the law is not new. The only part that's new is the firearm now appears in print in the schedule, whereas it didn't appear in print in the former regulation. Right. But the effect of the law is the same. In both cases, the firearm 
is prohibited if it's chambered for a caliber which exceeds 10,000 joules. Right. So you're saying that hunters are still unable to use their Ruger number one subject to what you've, subject to the caveat you've just articulated. Yes, that's correct. Uh, any, any Ruger number one which is uh, chambered for a caliber that produces less energy than 10,000 joules is, is not going to be prohibited either by the current regulations or by the proposed schedule. As I said before, there are other reasons why a firearm can become prohibited. So if someone had a Ruger number one with a sawed off barrel, it could be prohibited for that reason. But, but generally speaking, the Ruger number one rifles that are not chambered in high energy calibers will be non-restricted. And, and for further clarity, for the last two and a half years, no one has been able to use that version that can fire in excess of 10,000 joules, correct? Correct. The firearms chambered for the high-energy calibers have been prohibited since May of 2020. But again, just to clarify, hunters have still been able to use the single-shot hunting rifle, which fires smaller caliber rounds and that don't exceed 10,000 joules. Well the, well, the amnesty that's in effect right now for those firearms does provide for some use of the firearms, and it's theoretically possible someone would qualify, but the general answer is no. Okay. So... Then let's talk about the Weather, the Weatherby Mark V. I've had a few people write about the Weatherby Mark V. <laughs> Can you tell us whether this is a ban on all Weatherby Mark Vs or only the version of the Mark V that's capable of firing certain caliber cartridges? It, it, it's, it's the latter. It, it essentially follows the same pattern as for the Ruger No. 1. It's only the, uh, the rifles uh, that are chambered for the caliber that produces 10,000 joules of energy or more which would be prohibited either by the existing regulations, paragraph 95, or the proposed paragraph 95, pardon me, 96, sorry, 96 in, uh, in the schedule. So again, just like with the Ruger, hunters are still able to use their Weatherby Mark V, they just have to use it with cartridges that were designed for hunting. Well, the firearm actually has to be chambered for a cartridge that produces energy less than 10,000 joules. And how common is the use of the Weatherby Mark V without uh, the 10,000 joule capability? Since the majority of Weatherby Mark V rifles are non-restricted, we really don't have any data on, uh, on how many are in Canada or what they're used for. So this would not affect all of those folks that are using that gun to hunt at present? The, the, the existing regulations and the proposed of uh, Schedule uh, 1, paragraph 96 in particular, would not apply to the Weatherby Mark V if it's chambered for a, a caliber which produces energies of less than 10,000 joules. And these are, these are ordinary common calibers used by hunters in Canada, so, uh, so there are lots of calibers available and lots of calibers in common use which are nowhere near as energetic as 10,000 joules. And, you know, we hear from folks that, you know, you don't, we don't know what hunters use. When you say commonly used by hunters, where do you get, the, how do you inform that statement? That's just from general familiarity with the market. It's based on... Uh, as I said, general knowledge of the firearms industry, what, what, uh, what firearms are available, uh, what they're advertised for, the kind of ammunition that's advertised. Uh, so it's, it's just general information. So in some, there is a data collection and an and analysis process that takes place before, we, before such declarations are made, correct? Well, there's no, no data process uh, that could produce hard numbers on the use of non-restricted firearms. The, the data is simply uh, is not collected by the Canadian Firearms Program. And there may be other agencies that, that collect that kind of information, uh, but not us. But, 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 just to make, but just to clarify, I mean, you, you said generally used, and you explained how that determination is made. Uh, are you satisfied that that, satisfied is the word, I mean, You've used a term. I think it's an important term for us to use. The challenge with such terms is they are open to interpretation. Someone may say, well, I ordinarily use 10,000 joules to hunt 
X, Y, or Z. The notion of ordinarily used, would you suggest that that reflects the vast majority of folks that are hunting or, because I think it's important to quantify this, right? Like I think it's important for us not leave things in the ether. Well, so I, recognizing that you don't have specific data that speaks to the entirety of the universe of, of, of uh, such guns, when we use the term generally used, I think it's important for us to give as much context to people as possible as to how you come up with that so that people can be satisfied that their ordinarily used weapons and ordinarily used um, cartridges are not, you know, impacted here. I can only repeat what I said earlier, and that's just that's based on just watching the market, uh, uh, the reading pro reports produced by various other agencies that collect information of this nature in, in, in for various other purposes, and uh, just observing what the firearms businesses in Canada, the market in terms of firearms and ammunition, uh, would lead me to believe that the use of calibers that exceed 10,000 joules is, uh, has very limited application and very little uptake in Canada. It's relatively uncommon. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, that, the, the, your last statement, I think, is really important. The fact that it's relatively uncommon and not commonly used, I think, is important for us to all take away from this. Now, with that in mind, would the same rationale apply to the Mossberg 702 Plinkster Tactical? No, that's, a, okay. uh, that's an entirely different kind of firearm. Okay, so let's talk about the, that. The, the Mossberg 715T is a, a variant of, the, uh, of, of an AR pattern firearm, you know, AR-15, M4, M16, or AR-10. So that firearm is prohibited because of paragraph 87, which names the AR family firearms as being prohibited and any variant or modified version of it. And the Mossberg 715T is one such variant. Okay, and how long has it been prohibited? Uh, the we we well, I, we formed the opinion in 2020 that it was a prohibited firearm as a result of the change in the law. So since May of 2020 would be the definitive answer for you. And are other versions of the Mossberg of Mossberg 702 Plinkster Tactical available for hunters? Yes, the, the Mossberg Model 702 is a different firearm. It's a different model produced by, by Mossberg, and it is a non-restricted firearm. Okay. Somebody wrote to me about the Wesley Richards Model 19, 1897. Why was this model added to the list? The, the, that particular firearm is, again, listed in the section which deals with high-energy firearms because uh, that firearm is available in large African hunting calibers, some of which exceed 10,000 joules of energy. But again, it's only those firearms which are actually chambered for a high energy cartridge that are prohibited. Okay. Um, what about the Parker Brothers shotgun? A lot of discussion about this one. Parker Brothers made in a variety of models of shotguns. Parker Brothers is a manufacturer. It's not a specific kind of shotgun. And if a Parker shotgun uh, were prohibited by, by the action of the proposed schedule or by the existing regulations, it would be because it had a bore diameter that exceeded 20 millimeters. Uh, it, the, the Parker shotgun is a relatively old design of shotgun. It dates back certainly a hundred years or longer and there were there were gauges of shotgun ammunition used um, such as eight gauge which were larger than 20 millimeter and if such a shotgun were present today in Canada it would be prohibited because the caliber exceeds 20 millimeters thank you um, but, but uh, one last point sure. again it only applies that only applies to the Parker shotguns, which are actually chambered for a large bore caliber that exceeds 20 millimeters. Okay. And in the or in in the universe of 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 Parker Parker the shotguns, what is where where would that sit in the universe of all of all of, of all of the shotguns? Well, large large gauges are for shotguns are relatively uncommon. So this would not affect most people. That's that's uh, that's a subjective 
question, so I'm not sure I can answer that directly. The, there would be a, what I can say is there would be a relatively small population, although we can't put a number to it. Right. There would be a relatively small population of shotguns which have a bore diameter bigger than 10 gauge and therefore would interact with the 20 millimeter criterion. So now I'd like to turn to the Benelli M3, which has been the subject of a lot of discussion. I mentioned it uh, in our last meeting, uh, or a couple of meetings ago, uh, as one that w one of my conservative colleagues mentioned as being an example of a firearm which sees the government overreaching into hunting rifles. I think it'd be important for us to just get clarity on this. When was the Benelli M3 tactical shotgun prohibited in Canada? It was prohibited in the original series of of uh, OICs in, in the existing format uh, in 1992. 92. So it has not been available in Canada since 92. Or was it ever available in Canada, I suppose? Is it the well, the, the Benelli series of shotguns dates back to the 1980s, so it is it's possible uh, some shotguns came to Canada. But the, but the Benelli M1 and M3 um, prohibition uh, via Paragraph 7 and Schedule 1 uh, took effect in, in uh, 1992. And who uses um, the Benelli M3 tactical shotgun? Who would use the Benelli M3? Well, in, in Canada, uh, 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 the average person could not own it because it's prohibited. So if, if it were present in Canada, uh, it would be used by uh, exempt agencies such as police, uh, military, and so on. And just to clarify, there has been no attempt by any government, liberal or conservative, to unban that gun, correct? Uh, the, the, I, I'm, I, I can't speak to the history of parliamentary initiatives. Uh, I don't know whether there's been any attempt or not. But to confirm for me, it's been sitting on the list since the 1990s, and there have been changes in government, and it's, it still remains, correct? Yes, the, the Benelli M1 and M3 order, paragraph 7, has been in effect continuously since 1992 and remains in effect today. Okay. Um, now, for further clarity, there continue to be a number of um, Benelli weapons on this list, but they are specifically exempted from the prohibition. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell us why? That's a choice made by the governor and council in the case of the regulations, and it's a choice made by the framers of Schedule 1 in the matter that's currently before this committee. So, so that, that, that's, that's a government decision as to what, how to proceed on what firearms should be restricted, prohibited, or non-restricted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I still have a number of questions I'd like to go through. Mr. Cognizant of time, um, how would you like to proceed? So we have reached the end of our allotted period. Uh, so I propose that we uh, adjourn this matter until our next meeting to continue where we left off. Are we, uh, so we are, we are adjourned.